Let's turn in Romans to, to chapter 12. Um, the first two verses, you know, you know this scripture. Um, Therefore I urge you, brethren, to be by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your, in our, in New American Standard, says spiritual service of worship. It's, um, in the King James, it says your reasonable uh, service of worship. And then verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, Father, we praise you, we thank you, and we give you the glory as we proceed into this, uh, this area, Father, that, uh, that we know that you uh, are interested in the church understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, it's our reasonable service is to give our lives over to God. You know, Paul, this is just a, a nice little blip in the, you know, in the many things that he wrote uh, to the church, but it, it's incredibly profound that, that he says that this is reasonable. This is just reasonable. This is logical. This makes sense that you would give your life as a living sacrifice to Christ. The church doesn't call people to that anymore. We, we call you to come to church on Sunday and, and maybe a midweek service. And um, we call you to maybe read some scripture during the week and that sort of thing. But no one's being called to, to become a living sacrifice for God. Very few people. We just had some missionaries here from, that were from Istanbul. And uh, as we were driving in today, we were talking to our grandson, Eli. He was with us today. And, and uh, as we were driving in... Margie said to him, uh, don't eat too much of the gum back in the children's church area, you know. And, and then she remembered that the kids that were here from Istanbul, um, American, you know, kids, they're American citizens, they're, uh, they're missionaries to Istanbul, but they were, they've been uh, raised in is Istanbul, and, and a couple of them actually were, were born just before they went, and one was actually born there in Istanbul. And, um, and the interesting thing is, they had never had gum before. Their parents had to tell them how to eat gum. Um, and that might sound strange, but um, they, they said you can only chew it so long and then you have to spit it out. The kids had no clue what gum was. It's such a common thing for any one of us, that never given a thought. And, and I, I guess that's the perspective. We as Christians have lost perspective. These people have given up their lives and they're over there serving God and their whole life is given over to, to serving the Lord. And we're back here, you know, wondering about what we're going to do next weekend to entertain ourselves or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's uh, how are we going to get through this week? What do we need to do this week? And yes, life goes on. But um, have we ever really said, I'm a living sacrifice? You know, God, whatever you want me to do. We encountered a, a lady when we were traveling on Martha's Vineyard Island and We've been emailing back and forth and conversating with her. And since we visited her church and spoke about, you know, intimacy with God and following, find, finding his will for your life and following it, um, she's uh, writing us back. She's in the process of selling all her furniture, selling her house. She's going she's gonna to do everything. And she just wants God's will. She wants to do whatever God has called her to do. And she's a, a middle-aged mother. Her kids are all grown. And, and um, she's just going radical, not just because of her message. She'd already started moving in that direction before we got there, but she's, she's talking to us about the message and how it just moved her to the next step. And she just said, I want to find God's will, and I want to do His will for my life. And, and, and that is so few and far between anymore. You know, we, we've encountered that over the years. We've preached the message around the United States. We've encountered that and know of people that have become pastors as a result of it, and people that have become missionaries as a result of it. But, um, but it's so few compared to how many people hear the message. And yet, Paul's saying, this is just a, a normal thing. This, this should be a normal reaction to Christ giving his life for us, that we give our lives to him, we become servants to God. <clears throat> it should be a normal thing for us to say, God, here's my life, take it, whatever you want to do with it. I, I'm, I'm just here. But we 
what we do rather, and, and um, I don't know how will this ever change, I have no idea, but because the church isn't moving in this direction, but, but we rather say, Lord, come into my life and help my situations that I'm already in. You know, help me pay my bills, help me, you know, uh, pay my car payment, help me to get groceries. And, and those are natural things. I mean, God wants to do those things. He wants to meet our needs. And he's going to meet our needs if, if we in faith trust him in that area. <clears throat> but one thing we don't do, and, and I, I was guilty of this for 30 years of working and 30 years of being born again, or, or some portion, at least the first 20 years of being born again. I was guilty of the same thing. Lord, come in and make my life better. Make my, make my work easier. Make my, uh, you know, help me to make the right decisions in my workplace. Give me promotions, give me big paychecks, you know, meet my social and relational needs. And we were involved in a big Assembly God church where we were leaders in that church and and uh, and we went to every function and, and uh, every Valentine's party, every Christmas party, every Thanksgiving dinner, every everything that we had there. Um, and, and it never dawned on me that the whole focus was wrong. We were trying to, and I was a leader in that, but it, it never dawned on me that, that we were, what we were really doing is we were trying to entertain the people and keep the people in the church and, and, uh, and do things that made them comfortable and happy and, and have fun. But that's not what this says at all. This Bible doesn't say that at all. This Bible says that, that we should expect um, a persecution, that we should expect rejection, that we should expect everything that Jesus received. It also says we should expect people to be healed, and and we should expect demons to be. We should expect demons to be uh, at at uh, mercy to us, or whatever. You know, mercy at, at you know, afraid of us, you know, and, and respond to us. But but we just kind of go on with life, and, and all the things that we deem important really aren't necessarily the things God deems important at all, and. Um, and, and I kind of pity you guys are here receiving this message when there's so many thousands of other people that need to hear this message and aren't. Um, I, I'm going to refer back uh, several times to this book called Renaissance, written by Os Guinness. So um, I'm just kind of making that an overall thing because I'm not going to necessarily uh, give him credit each time because of the book. But um, I, I want to read this prayer. And I, I don't like to read to people because um, I, I don't, I just don't, I, I don't think that's a good thing to do from the pulpit. But I want you to hear this prayer that he prays um, as he writes the book of the condition of the Church of the West. Now he's from Ireland, uh, and he's a rather famous fellow from Ireland, but um, he's writing about the church in the West. He's talking about Europe, he's talking about the United States, he's talking about all of us. And he hones into the United States several times in the book, but he has this prayer at the end of his first chapter. I'm, I'm probably going to actually read two things today, a, a prayer now and a prayer at the end that, that he's written in the book. But it's interesting that he closes each chapter in a prayer. He's much more, um, uh, much more part of the, of the established church, if you want to think of it that way. But he sees, he's able to see what's going on. Um, but he, write, he, he writes this prayer. King of heaven, Lord of the years and sovereign over time and history, grant to us such an overpowering knowledge of who you are that our trust in you may be unshakable. Grant to us also a sufficient understanding of the sign of the times which we live in that we may know how to serve your purposes in our generation and more truly be your people in the world today. To that end, O oh Lord, revive us again Draw us closer to yourself and to each other where there is false contentment with our present condition so in holy restlessness. I don't know if I need to repeat that, but where there is false contentment within our present condition so in us a holy restlessness. That, that's what we're walking in right now is a, is, is a false contentment. Where there is despair, be our hope again for your sake empower us to be your salt and light in the world. And thus, for, and thus your force for human flourishing of your shalom in the name of Jesus, your peace in the name of Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, 
His book speaks about the condition of the church in the West and how we've gone far from this text I just read you from Romans. He speaks of um, the church of the West. He begins by speaking historically of it. First of all, he says uh, a misnomer, particularly in America and in, in European countries, is that Christianity is dead. Yet Christianity, he says in his book, is the largest religion on earth and ever has been on earth. It's by far the largest religion on earth. Just You can combine the Hindus, the Buddhists, all those together, and they don't even come close to Christianity. Christianity is the largest. Now, of course, when he speaks of Christianity, he likes to include the Anglican Church because he's from that area. He likes to include the Catholic Church and all that. But... It, we wouldn't necessarily consider that the church because of uh, of their beliefs, but he said by and large it's you know it, it, it's way way bigger than that. And what we think of in the church, we think of kind of little huddled masses in each of our little churches struggling to to make it because we have so many people around us who uh, who aren't Christians or atheists. They're probably not any religion, not any practicing religion. They may call themselves a religion. But even if you take away all the people that, that, that say they're Christians but practice no Christianity at all and focus just on the ones that are in church today, we're still the largest uh, religion on earth. We are by far the largest religion on earth. Our Bible is the most published book in all the history of mankind. And there isn't another book that even comes close. Not even comes close. We're talking half percentiles compared to to 100%. And, and this is the book. And it's translated in more languages than any other book in the existence of mankind or ever has been. And yet, somehow, the enemy has us thinking that we're, we're, we're this teeny minority that, that really has no impact. And as a result of it, and that's one of the things he mentions in here, as a result of it, these, these minority groups like the gays and the homosexuals, the pro-abortion people, these minority people have been manipulating us, the church, because we don't realize we don't realize how big we are. We have no clue about how big we are. And if we could get together, which probably isn't going to happen in our thinking, then, then things would change. But this is what happened in the evolution of Christianity. The first church really was before Acts. It was before Pentecost. The first church was really the church of Jesus Christ as he walked with his disciples around the, the, this little area of the world that they impacted at that time. And he did what the church is to do. He cast out demons. He prayed for the sick. He saw them healed. He fed the hungry. He, he met both uh, supernatural and social uh, needs. Yeah, and he, you know that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, that's how the church started. And then as Christ rose and empowered the church with his power to do the same thing, we read in Acts and in the epistles, the, the letters, we, we read the same thing is happening in this first century that we're reading about. Because we tend to think of this all happened right within a few years, but this is really, this is, a, this is almost a century of things going on in this book. And so we read that, and then, and then suddenly... Christianity changed in about 300 when Constantine started Catholicism. Suddenly the church changed. And here's the interesting, and this is where I'm headed, is the impact that the church has, whether they're right or wrong, the impact the church is having on the world. So you take Christianity, really established, uh, we don't know Constantine's art, we don't know if he was saved, we don't know exactly what went on, but we know that he took it to the benefit of Rome because he used it to fight his battles, the cross became the symbol of, of their, you know, he painted crosses on the on the shields and all that kind of stuff. And um, and then it became the force that went into countries all over as Rome took over other countries. And it became the force that maintained those countries because the Roman army was never large enough to control all these areas. So they used the superstition of monks and Christianity to control these areas. And all they did was convert the religions, the pagan religions they had, and, and kind of morph them into Christianity. 
And that's where we get Halloween. We're about to have Halloween. Of course, that's Holy Swalween that, that came from the Druids. And, um, and we changed that from Halloween when we got there to Holy Saints Day. If you're a Catholic or Lutheran, you might know that it's Holy Saints Day. And, um, and trying to maintain some religious tradition of the people, their, their pagan religion, yet inserting Christianity in there. And so we said that's the day, that was the day they worshiped the dead, and so that's the day we worship the dead in the form of saints. Now, you, the point I'm still making is that all of a sudden now Christianity is influencing larger and larger people. Unfortunately, it wasn't true Christianity in that sense. Now, it was Christianity in the fact that it raised the name of Jesus. It's Christianity in the fact that it praised Him. It, it missed the gospel because it made it a gospel of works and... and uh, and that, that was convenient to control the people. If, you don't, if you're not a good person, you're going to hell. And here's this, this, this thing I can't see, this place I don't know about. But historically, it was in most religions. There was some place of punishment or reward after, after this life. So it, it was there. So they just fit their religion into the, the particular culture so it worked well. And, and we yet celebrate Halloween today, thousands and thousands of years after the Romans went in and conquered the Druids. So, so the, the influence, the influence of what Christianity is and was, and we still have huge numbers of Catholics, we have popes, we have the, we have the whole thing, right? And then, then suddenly there were some fellows that, uh, particularly a king, who, who didn't like the pope and didn't like the, the and, and I won't get into the history of it, I can explain to you why, but, but he started his own thing. And he became the king of England, became the pope or the lead of the church, and they started the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And, and it was it, much like the Catholic Church, it was a political church, not a real, uh, not a real church. And they controlled, they controlled their countries with the same sort of thing, but they had bishops and archbishops, and, and uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't go along with it, you got beheaded and all that sort of thing. So, so they started their own their own spin on, on that. Then, uh, then we had the Reformation, and, and I'm actually skipping some things because I don't want to belabor this issue, but then we had the Reformation, and we had Martin Luther, who, who was the first that came out as a Catholic monk and, um, and said, hey, wait a minute, we've missed this whole thing. Uh, heaven's a gift. It's not something that I can earn or be good enough to gain, and, uh, because what would I have to do? You know, my... It wouldn't be dependent upon where I started my life, whether I was started in a home, in a nice Christian home, or where I started on the streets, you know, of Germany or whatever. So, so he he asked these questions. He put up his thesis, and and of course that caused no little stir, and and he became an enemy of the of Catholicism. I mean, they already had their problem with England, and now they've got they've got this guy in Germany that's doing this thing. And because the popularity grew so fast, it, it, it became un well. The, the popes couldn't kill him. At first, he hid in the woods and everything. But finally, finally, it grew so fast that they, the popes couldn't kill him. And we, as a result, of it had Catholicism without a pope, and with salvation by grace and faith, and not by not by works. And that evolved in the Lutheran Church, but. The Lutheran Church kept most of the Catholic, even though they would like to say, oh, we're not definitely not Catholic, and the Catholics say the Lutherans are definitely not Catholics, and vice versa. But um, they basically kept uh, the, the, most of the tenets of the Catholic faith. And of course, you know, he was a monk, you know, and he was indoctrinated in both of things. So he, he, uh, he, <laughs> excuse me, he, uh, he just kept that thing going. And then, then there was Reformation in, in, in the northern parts of, of Europe uh, as uh, Calvin began to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this whole thing Luther's got going is right. And now, now Luther reformed the Catholic Church in that sense. He didn't really change the Catholic Church, but he brought a Reformation to a portion of the Catholic Church, at least the German portion. And now, now Calvin is going to do the same thing to northern uh, the northern parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland, and those areas, and so he brings he brings that revival, and then John Wesley brings and Whitfield and there's others in Tyndale, they they bring a revival into more the central part 
of, uh, of the Anglican Church. And so, oh, I, I'm just saying this because what you see as you look back is you see that these religions, for a great part, simply uh, became part of the culture, but then had a, a, a profound effect on the culture. But also the culture had a profound effect on those particular reformations, those particular churches. Um, and, and now we are here in the future. And we're in the church in America where there's been a great, a great outpouring of the evangelical church, uh, primarily the Baptist. You know, that's probably the biggest one of all of them is the, is the Baptist. You know, if you take all the Baptists, the Southern Baptists, and all the other Baptists, American Baptists, and you begin to combine them all, you, you're going to have They basically believe the same thing. And they believe that the immersion, baptism by immersion, was, you know, a big thing as a statement of when you changed your life. The, the thing is, is that evolved into the church, the, the Protestant church, as we call it, during the, <clears throat> during the late 1800s, early 1900s, that, that we saw historically as we look back even into our parents' lives and our grandparents' lives. And with that came the churches that, that the British brought over and, um, and when they escaped the, the rule of the king and became freedom of religion in America, which was the biggest uh, part of the fight, they became, uh, they became churches that were named, interestingly enough, you may not think about this, but they were named by their form of government within the church. The Presbyterian Church is called the Presbyterian Church because their form of government is, is a board of presbyters that run the whole church at, at a local level, and then, and then there's presbyters at a, at a regional level, and then presbyters at a, at a much higher level. And so um, th th we have the presbyters, and so that we call that the Presbyterian Church. Episcopalian Church, the same thing. It's just it's just established by its form of government. And so, you know, where are we really in true Christianity? Well, you know, I think it always is going to be in the hearts of individuals. There's going to be true Christianity in the hearts of individuals. But by and large, the church isn't necessarily truly Christian. And now we come kind of into our age, and this is where I wanted to, to bring us so we understand. We've come to our age, and, and when I speak of our age, we're kind of in the gap we came to the Lord in the 80s when the born again movement, the emphasis was on uh, kind of the power of positive gaining. You know, pray and you can get this and pray and you can get that. Our God's a good God. Let's take the organs out of the church and put in a band and get some upbeat music going. Let's, let's modernize the church to make it more appealing to the people because otherwise they're going to leave. They're not going to keep coming to, you know, uh, Aunt Sally sitting up there playing the organ, boom, 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 you know, and having pastors stand up here and say, you're going to go to hell if you don't, you know. They weren't going to receive that anymore because of the freedom of the 60s. You know, it was like, I don't have to respect my parents anymore. I have to respect the system. And uh, they went through that until they either got arrested for drugs or found out that they needed to go to college and get a degree and get a job. But, but. They weren't going to go to mom and dad's church. You know, this is no longer a period at mom and dad's church. So the church became more of a, a it, it started moving towards a, a social country club. Because I don't want to go to the bars. I don't want to go do pot. I don't want, to, I don't want that lifestyle. And, uh, but I want some sort of a, a corporate lifestyle that I can get together with other people and enjoy the things of life. So the churches, the, the churches began to get really big, and it became like country clubs, um, which I just sent this pastor I was talking about in, in New York. I just sent him an email. They just bought a country club. They bought IBM's uh, country club that used to belong to the company, and they are moving their church from the church to the country club, and they're, they're taking over the whole, I don't know how huge it is, country club. And there's been some resistance in the community by that, but, but by and large, it's a good thing. And so they have a, a full 12th grade Christian school and, and a church that they're moving to this country club. 
and they've asked us to pray that they can sell their property at a reasonable price because they have a huge church already. But this is going to be better yet. And I thought, I thought to myself, and I mentioned to him, I said, it's interesting. While well, the churches in America are becoming country clubs, here's a church that the country club is becoming a church, which I thought was kind of a, a cool thing. And, and he's very sold out to the Lord and very interested in seeing people truly grow in their relationship with God. But um, it, here we have the church becomes my social hub. Now, I'm going to still do my job. I'm going to still go to work. I'm going to still go through all of life's troubles and relations and all that sort of thing. And... Um, but, but the, the impact of church on life begins to change. Where it used to be, you know, as the church spoke, and, and some of this re is, is still in the Catholic Church, but not by and large in the Protestant Church, in, in the non-evangelical non Protestant churches, um, abortion became kind of all right. Divorce became more acceptable. And... Um, and, and uh, and, and then now, you know, we can even have, in some of the denominations, we can have uh, uh, homosexuals and lesbians being in the leadership in churches and in the pulpit. And so, you, you see, culture has overtaken those churches. But more subtly, and this is, this is what his book about is Renaissance, and Renaissance means it's a French word for renewal or revival or whatever, but... but um, the, the renaissance that we hear about in history was the renaissance of the great kings and the families and the wealth and all that kind of stuff. But actually, as he states in the book, the real renaissance that was going on at that time was in the church. There was great revivals going on in the church. And the word renaissance with regards to, with, with regards to happenings at that time actually was about the church first. And then, the, then it kind of evolved into the into the culture and we think of the renaissance different a time of great you know dressing up and parties and all that kind of stuff but so he named his book renaissance about the renewal saying the american church needs renewal and the reason is is because we don't trust in the gospel anymore we don't trust in jesus christ in his name we just sang that song uh we just sang that song there's power in the name of jesus we don't trust in him anymore now, oh yeah, we trust in Him for our salvation. We trust Him in, in our prayer closet when we need this or that need met. But we don't trust in Him in the church. You know, we trust in the church today. And, and I'll give an example. When I first came to uh, when I first came to be a pastor, uh, people were excited because uh, my degree is in engineering and and my postgraduate work is in statistics and. Um, and everybody was excited because I would understand all these things that the church was moving into. And I went to this class they call a boot camp, and I went to this class my wife and I did, and I was, I was, I was, I don't know how to say it, I was just profoundly disappointed. Here we are, a Pentecostal denomination, emphasizing the Spirit of God and the supernatural. And we go to this training class for new pastors that are going to go out and plant churches. And it was all about uh, little yellow stickies on the wall and casting your vision and casting your mission statement and, and, um, and, and, and all these techniques that they spent the next three or four days teaching us um, were things that we'd already given up on in industry and said that's, it's not going to work. That stuff doesn't work. And now the church, instead of, instead of the, the, the church running first and then the, the world kind of demolishing it as we go, behind us, the church is running behind the world and picking up the worldly techniques. And it's interesting because he identifies that in this book and says that somewhere along the line we began to pick up the worldly techniques and statistics and numbers and polls and what people in the pews wanted became more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I say that in, in, this, in this context uh, we, just, we know of a church um, and I won't say where it is because I don't want to offend anybody, but we know of a church that just put out a thing that they're having a grand opening for their new building. And one of the things in it, they say there'll be bounce houses, there'll be carnival games, there'll be, all, there'll be food, there'll be fun, and all this stuff. And they specifically said there will be no preaching. We promise not to preach to you, and we promise not to share the gospel to you. And they're closing their church today, while I'm speaking, today their church is, is closed 
to invite the public in for an open house. For an open house. Promise no gospel, no preaching to you. Just come and have fun with us. Now, th that's interesting because you'd say, first of all, what's so wrong with that? You know, it, it, you know, a fisherman puts a worm on his hook to catch a fish. You know, maybe, right. maybe they're just out fishing for people. And, and from the from the from the worldly standpoint, through my rationalization standpoint, that makes sense. Let's have a party and invite everybody. That makes sense. We'll 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 attract them here so that they can see, you know, our facilities and meet people and 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 you know make connections and make social relationships. Sounds good. But to promise them that you're not going to preach to them and promise them that you're not going to present the gospel to them. This is a spirit-filled assembly got church. This isn't a this isn't a Lutheran church or a or a Methodist church or you know this is a it, it isn't even a Baptist or an evangelical church. This is this is a spirit-filled supposedly uh, church, and so all reasoning makes sense. And this church is growing. They just built this new huge building. They already had a big, very nice building, and it talks about. Uh, their, their coffee bar and coming for the coffee bar and, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and, and what that's saying is, and some of you say I'm old-fashioned, <clears throat> but what that is saying is the gospel is not powerful enough to bring people. Right. So I have to do something different. Right. Now the problem with that is, is, in a sense, that's correct if I just want people. If I'm content with just having pews filled, having money come in. If I am content with that, with a little bit of teaching, let's mix in a little bit of teaching. None of this, none of this give your life sacrificially to God that we just read in Romans 12, 1. But but so so what's happening, and 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 Oz mentions it in his book, is where Paul says, be no longer conformed to this world, but be transformed. What's happening to the church in America is that we are no longer being transformed, but being conformed. We've turned that scripture around to fit the system mm -hmm. so that we can attract people and fill the building. But the trouble is, and, and he says it in here, what you get is a Christianity that's a mile wide and an inch deep. There's no true commitment. There's, there's really a question of how many people in the church are actually really saved. Um, I, I remember a, a friend of ours uh, that used to visit Trinity all the time. Um, his name just escaped me for a second. I don't know why. Re, re, uh, Parrish Reedhead. Yeah, thank you. Parrish Reedhead, um, he wrote a book called Easy Believism. And he said that was going to be the destruction of the church. He wrote this about uh, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. He wrote a book called Easy Believism. And he said what we've done is we've just made Christianity a little prayer at the front of the church or at home, you know, if you don't want to do it in front of other people. And, and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and boom, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to heaven. Now, now, according to Romans 10, that's correct. If I believe in my heart, right. if I believe in my heart, and that's, that's the part, you know, we've got the part down. If I believe in my heart, and then I share it with other people, if I have the boldness to share it with other people, because it's in my heart, then it's a real thing. But if I just pray this prayer and I go to church on some regular basis and, and socialize with all my friends there and I haven't really truly made a change, then am I really a Christian? Am I really a Christian? I've been struggling with this the last couple of weeks. I've just been ornery and, and, and hard to live with the last few weeks. And um, I'm not even sure why. But I think of the scripture in Galatians where it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and, and I've been angry, so that takes out joy. Um, I haven't been very loving. I haven't been very kind. I haven't been patient. And, and it's a mixture of things I know that's going on in myself. I'm struggling with the fact that, that this is real, that this is a problem in the church, and, and I can literally seemingly do nothing about it. Because anything that I try and do would be in direct... Uh, you know, if I was to go to this pastor that's having the party this weekend instead of church, it, I, I'd be highly criticized because we got a small church with few people in a rented building, and he just built a monstrous building and is selling his other building that 
we could fit 20 of or 10 or 15 of ours in that church. And, and he would say, yeah, that makes no sense. You know, look at me. Look at what I've got going on. Look at what's going on here. My methods work better than your methods. But, but it's not in my thinking, and maybe he's being led to the Lord to do it this way, but in my thinking, that's not the gospel. That's not the truth. That's not truly life-changing stuff. It might be behavioral changing. In other words, now I'm going to go to church. I like the people there. I'm going to do some stuff. I'm not going to be too offended by the, 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 the PowerPoint presentations that are made instead of the kind of teaching things. I remember a friend of mine, a, a friend of mine, um, his family, I, I talked to him about Christ and presented Christ to him. And, and uh, he happened to be a Catholic because his wife was, but not because he was raised that way. He was Lutheran or something. And he... Uh, he, he said, oh, I used to go to church when I was a kid. And I said, oh, really? And his name was Jeff. I said, really, Jeff? And he said, yeah. He said, we used to go to church every Sunday, just like clockwork. And then we'd go to Village Inn afterwards, and everybody from church would come to Village Inn, and we'd just have a wonderful time. And then one morning, my dad was, and, and we were having a little trouble getting up one morning, and, and my dad began thinking, the, the reason we go to church is to have a relationship with all these people who we meet with after at Village Inn anyhow, so why don't we just skip a step? Oh. And he said after that, they never went to church. They just went to the village inn and met all the people from church that came to the village inn after church. And it worked out fine for them. They didn't have to listen to this guy preach at them. You see, and in a sense, what we're done is we said, let's have everybody in and we'll do the village inn thing without the gospel. We'll do the village inn thing. So what we're really saying is the largest, most impacting church Religion in all of the earth no longer has power in America because it's the gospel that has the power, but we've decided it's not the gospel, it's the statistics, it's the, it, it, it's the seeker sensitive, it's, the, it's the, the fun and games, the social networking, it's, it's all that, and it's not really the gospel. And what you end up with is a bunch of really, really shallow Christians, or, or they're not even Christians at all. And they're just coming to the church, and eventually they'll realize they can just go to Village Inn instead. Right. And it's just a matter of time, unless they don't go to Village Inn and they get their fellowship within the church. So we have to make sure that they get plenty of fellowship within the church and very little of the truth. And maybe, maybe if we give them some principles from, from this book, then we can begin to change some of their behaviors. But we can change behaviors with never ever really changing hearts. And if we don't change their hearts, they're Christian in name only and they're headed to hell. So, so how influential is this? How influential is this? And what he mentions in his book, the scary part, he said, is that we have gone to the world with our gospel. And we've sent missionaries out to all these countries. But now we have something called the internet. Now we have something called the internet. And now we send our missionaries into these countries, which he calls the global south. And he's considering that Asia, Africa, all those unreached nations, Muslim countries. And we've sent people into those countries and people have gotten born again. China has actually the largest growing population of born again Christians on earth today. China, where it's completely suppressed or has been in the past, they're starting to loosen up. And, and they, are, they are the fastest growing church on earth today, is China. Here's the interesting thing is, though. What's happening, what's happening is that, what's happening is that, that the, just, I'll just have to wait a second, I guess. I, I can't concentrate. What's happening as a result is, as the people then get born again and they have access to the internet, they begin to look, see, it's the, uh, the Americans that brought Christianity to them. It's the Americans and their, their, their uh, misinterpretation of Christianity is they think that Christians in America are all self-sacrificial and daring to bring the gospel as the, as the missionaries that came to bring them the gospel at risk of their own lives, right? They think we're all like that. They think that's what 
Christianity in America is all about. And we are these daring people that would, that would give up our whole lives and our whole comfortable Western existence to go to a third world country and present the gospel and see people get saved. But then they watch us on the internet and they see something completely different. They see on one end, one spectrum over here, the emphasis is, um, is you know, name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. You know, here these people are, they don't know where they're going to get their next meal. They're persecuted in the church. The only place they can meet is in somebody's basement at night on an off, on off night so they're not be caught and not get in trouble and not get in, thrown in prison. They're meeting in these underground churches and they turn on the internet at, at their library or wherever they have access or education area and they see these name it and claim it people and say, you can have a new Winnebago, you can have a new TV, you can have a new house, you can have a new car, you can have all this. All you got to do is send us some money. And they're like confused because this is nothing like the Christians that came sacrificially to their country to bring them the gospel and the truth that would bring in the midst of their persecution love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and that sort of thing. So now they're totally confused. Do you begin to see that our culture of Christianity, like Catholicism, affected all of Europe and everything else? And then the Catholics eventually oozed into all parts of the world. Their kind of Christianity affected everybody. We were in Ecuador. We were doing missionary work in Ecuador. And they took us to uh, the, the Catholic church. It was actually the first church ever built in the Americas. The first quote-unquote Christian church ever built in the Americas was in uh, Quito, Ecuador. And we got to go there. And out in front of this Catholic church is people, there's a whole square, it's like a quarter of a mile in each direction, or maybe even more, almost a, a mile in each direction. It's all stone, and, and there's tents everywhere, these little tent booths where they sell and stuff. And because they were on part of the church property, they were selling holy things that would help your life and help your problems in life and that sort of thing. So they had, they had imported things from Israel because that made them holy. So you could go buy a holy toaster. And on the bottom it said made in Israel or maybe it was assembled in Israel. You could buy a holy toaster. And see, if you bought a holy toaster, then your toast wouldn't burn in the morning. If you bought a holy iron, then you'd have to worry about scorching your clothes. I'm serious. This is what they were selling. And it was all considered holy because they had gotten permission and they gave a cut to the Catholic Church for selling this stuff on their property. And people came to buy it superstitious, you could buy holy curtains to keep the, the, the thieves out because maybe you didn't have a security system in Quito, Ecuador, your house is built out of cardboard and crates. And so you bought, you bought these holy curtains to keep the, the bad guys out of your house because the holy curtain. I mean, that's what was there. Holy blinds, holy irons, holy ironing boards, holy kitchen appliances, holy knives and, and, and forks, and anything you wanted to buy that was holy. Then you went up onto the next level, which was, which was about, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 feet wide and probably, you know, a block long. And that was right up, and that was about 30 steps up. That was at the level of the entrance of the church. And you got there, and that's where they sold all the holy religious stuff. You could buy a candle that you could go in and light and put in the church so that you might get some prayer answered. You can buy holy scapulas, which if you're not a Catholic, you don't even know what scapulas are, but it's a, it's a ribbon you wear around your neck with a picture of a saint on it. You can buy holy rosaries, blessed by the Pope or whatever, I don't know. And, and these poor people had nothing. They had nothing. They lived in cardboard houses built with, with uh, thrown out pallets and stuff like that. And they're taking what little tiny money they have, and they're trying to buy holy appliances from Israel, and then they go up a step and they, they're, they're going to buy holy paraphernalia for their, for their homes. But to enter, the, to enter the Catholic Church at the doors, there's these huge doors that are probably almost three stories high and about 25 feet wide. They're just magnificent doors. And they're completely covered in gold. Completely covered in gold. I mean, you can take a penknife and scrape some off and, and, and pay for the whole 
months, everything, years probably, groceries and everything else. But they were scared to death to touch the doors because if you even touch the doors, you could go to hell. You could instantly drop and go to hell. Because see, that's what the Catholicism had brought because they took all the gold from the Inca Indians, the Mayan Indians, and they couldn't import it back to, in, back to Spain. They couldn't take it back to Spain because the Queen of England had hired privateers, which are actually pirates, to sink the ships or get the gold if they could that was being brought from South America to Spain. And they, they, you've heard of privateers. They were hired pirates, hired by the Queen of England to sink the ships because she didn't care whether or not she got the gold. She just didn't want Spain to get the gold because they were building the great Spanish Armada and they were going to come up and destroy England by the sea. So she hired pirates. So you couldn't get the pirates. You couldn't, the pirates would get the gold before it got to Spain. So you had to get the gold away from the Mayans, but you had to put it in a context that they couldn't take it. So they made great big statues of, of saints. They, they lined the walls, the ceilings, the doors with gold. Gold was everywhere. They said there was somewhere in the neighborhood, and this is 30 years ago, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of $90 billion, $94 billion worth of gold. In that church while the people out front were starving and we were calling that the church. The profound effect that Christianity has had on the earth is incredible. The corruption within Christianity and the profound effect it has had is incredible. Now I mentioned the name of the claim people. Let's go to the other end and go to the social churches that I was talking about just now. These people are going and hiding in basements to raise their hands and worship God. And the pastor, he quotes a Chinese pastor in here, he says, you know, he says the people in China are one answered prayer away from going back to their Hinduism and Buddhism. It's so fragile, the Christian church is so fragile in China that these people are only one unanswered prayer away from going back to their old way of life. Because that superstition seemed to fulfill their needs to some extent. Now you're telling them Jesus is going to meet your needs, but he's going to meet them in a way that's going to cause you to change who you are inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily going to change your condition or situation. And over here we have name it and claim it. And over here we have these social churches that are coming to have fun and have coffee. These people are worshiping in a basement someplace, worried for their life. And they're seeing on the internet that the focus of the evangelical church, the one that sent the missionaries to their country, the focus of that church is food, fun, and fellowship. And they don't understand what they're doing in this dark basement. Are we having a profound effect on the world because of the, because of the disintegration of the true church of Jesus Christ in the United States? We've made it into something else and they're saying, wait a minute, if this is Christianity, we want it. We want the food, fun, and fellowship. We want the Winnebago's. But in reality, the only thing that's holding their true Christ their Christianity together is true Christianity, the gospel, because they're going to be persecuted when they try to get these other things. But that's how Christianity is now becoming defined to them. So we're not only destroying Christianity in America with all this nonsense. We're destroying Christianity throughout the world with this nonsense. And yet his prayer, as you just read, open our eyes because we don't even know it. He says, he says, as I write this book, he says, most pastors won't read it. And he says, if they do read it, they'll never see themselves because they're so entrenched in what they're doing as a way to reach their community. They think that's the way to do it. And they've lost the power of the gospel and, and traded it in for the power of cultural experiences, social things, entertainment. And where are we? Where are we? What are we going to do? And that's that's the, the frustration I've had for the last couple of weeks that's just turned me into a monster. I, I just don't know. What are we going to do? I take this message to the 50 states. And we hear of changes. Praise God for that. And hopefully it's, and there's many more that we never hear reported back. But, but what are we doing? What are we doing, church, to make a difference? What are we as individuals? There's so few of us here. But what are we doing to make that difference? Is there any sacrifice in our life? Or are we sitting here in the pews wondering, oh, pastor, 
this is nice, but I really, really go to that new church that has the upbeat music and the fun and the coffee and the orange juice and cookies and donuts. And we're low on ourselves. We're low on ourselves into some kind of uh, false Christianity, which has, and the reason I went back into the history, as boring as it may have seemed to some of you, it showed you that Caesar in Rome brought Christianity to the world, but was it Christianity at all? How many people were raised Catholic, were devoted to their Catholic way of life and their Catholic church and their priests and their popes and all that kind of stuff and are burning in hell today because they never once heard the true gospel preached to them. And we call that Christianity. This is why I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know how to reach people anymore. I'll go to these churches. I'll continue to complete the 50 states and I'll go wherever any pastor will have me come and speak about this. And praise God for you guys because you let me go do it. Because pastors are amazed. How can your church let you go do this? And I say, I think that the only thing I can think is that they, they realize the influence they're having on the rest of the nation. And that it might be something positive from this little church in Plattsburgh, Nebraska. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We are not being transformed. We are conforming the church to the world. We're relying more on statistics. We're relying more on surveys. We're relying more on our rationalization of what other churches are doing more than we are on the gospel of Jesus Christ because you know what? I believe with all my heart the pastors are scared to death of failure. They're scared to death that they may stand before a church of a shrunken congregation and preach the truth. And what they're doing is they're just running as fast as they can and it doesn't matter which direction, wrong direction, right direction. They're just running as fast as they can ahead of the people to try and make sure there's plenty of food, fun, and fellowship for them. And a little bit of gospel sprinkled in. A little bit of Jesus sprinkled in. And Jesus doesn't talk about a little bit of sprinkle. Paul says, this is your most basic, reasonable sacrifice to give your whole life for Jesus Christ. Whatever you want me to do, Jesus, that's what I'm going to do. And I'll continue to do it until I can do it no longer. Until my health or, or political situations or laws or whatever get me to a point that I can no longer... I can no longer sustain what God has called me to do. Otherwise, I will do what he's called me to do until I drop dead. And that's the question. Is, do you even know what he wants you to do? Do you even know? Have you even pursued that, that what God do you want me to do? What is it I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life? Or have we just settled in? If we just settled in? If somebody came to you and said, you know what? I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, and we do it with infomercials all the time, I can guarantee you that if you come and follow these steps and these procedures, um, buying and selling property, buying these multi-level drugs, or whatever it is, it, I can guarantee you that you'll make millions of dollars. Now, if, if you were absolutely assured that they could actually do that, what would you do with your life and time? You would pursue that with everything you've got to make those millions of dollars. Yes, but the question is, the question is, what will we do with God? Will we pursue? Will we search after Him? Will we, will we pursue Him with all of our lives or not? What will we do with Jesus Christ? And I'm going to close with another prayer that he wrote in his book. After the second chapter, I'm not that far in the book yet. I'm only about halfway through the book. But I'm going to close with this prayer. And I, I don't really need you to pray this prayer. I want you to hear what he's saying in the prayer, given what, what he said before. You know, Jesus Christ said that this gospel will either be a rock that you throw yourself upon or it'll be a rock that crushes you. We're afraid to set the stone out there anymore. We're afraid to set the gospel, the stone out there. 
because we're afraid that it may crush some people that we want in our church because they they're socially acceptable they have good finances they tithe well you know we're afraid to put the rock out there Isaiah said it's going to be a stumbling stone to many, the gospel. Paul repeated it in Romans chapter 9. He said, 9.33, he says this is going to be a stumbling stone. We're afraid to lay the stone out there. We're afraid of what might happen if we lay the stone out there. This was his prayer as I close today. O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all who have gone before us on this earth, we give thanks for your faithfulness from generation to generation. We ask your forgiveness that we live as if we were the only concern in our time and we're only and, and the only time there is is now. Grant that we seek to serve you as we may understand our times, that we may see our times in the light of all times and of eternity. And that we may understand the purposes, our purposes, and your purposes in our generation. May no challenge or crisis daunt us. No enemy or attack unnerve us. No failure or setback cause us to take our hands off the plow and let, or let the sword slip from our hands. Grant then that we may rise to the challenge of our time as great heroes of the faith did before us so that together with them we may be the servant agents of God's kingdom and worthy of your calling in the name of Jesus amen I don't know if, if, if you caught all that as I said it but basically what he's saying is forgive us great saints of past forgive us the, the ones in, in Hebrews you know the Noahs the Davids this, the, you know, all the people that went before us. The Enochs, the Elijahs, the Isaiahs, all those who went before us. He's basically saying his prayer, forgive us because we've made, we've made a sham of the whole thing. And help us to change that. Help us to change that. Help us to put our backs to the plow, our hand to the plow, and not turn back. And... Uh, the only way we're going to find that out is through prayer and relationship with Jesus Christ to find out exactly where our plow should be going. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We give you the glory in Jesus Christ's name. You're worthy of all praise and honor. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us as a church. Help us as the church in America to, to begin to see the reality of the gospel. God, I pray that it doesn't take uh, the terrible diseases and earthquakes and terrible attacks on us and our governmental system. And, and I pray that it doesn't take that. I pray that the church would, would leave its lulled state. And that we would begin to do what Jesus Christ called us to do in his name. Amen. Why don't we close with a song and we will be done.